Hello everyone, um, welcome to Smart Lighting, Control and Connectivity. Um, over the next um, half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour, uh, we're going to discuss um, lighting. Um, we'll actually go a bit deep into LED lighting, um, but it's all about how we can do smart lighting. A uh, bit about myself, my name is Raj Devnath. I'm the global segment leader for building and office automation here at Renesis. Um, I also handle our Wi-Fi marketing. So I create products and solutions towards these end markets. I have more than 15 years experience in the industry. I've been developing solutions at various end markets. Um, of course, building and home automation, connectivity, video, um, consumer electronics. Um, I've had I've put on many different hats. I've been a design engineer, I've been an engineering manager, a product manager, and more recently a global segment leader. I have an MSWE from UC Santa Barbara and an MBA from UC Berkeley. So you've seen this slide several times before, so you can engage with Renesis uh, multiple different ways, devices, platforms, solutions. Um, during the course of the next one hour, I'll talk about uh, lighting, uh, more specifically about LED lighting, what kind of devices, platforms, and solutions that Renesis has. Uh, what we would ideally like you to take away from this, so we are going to start um, to discuss control and connectivity. We'll look at the current lighting solutions. We're going to first answer the question, why do I need to care about control and connectivity? Um, then we're going to address, how are you going to address control and connectivity? Um, then we're going to look at something which we call smart lighting. What is smart lighting? How can you put that into your solutions? How can you add value add into your lighting solutions? Um, how is this going to help you? Um, we're going to follow the theme of the conference, Accelerate, Innovate, and Differentiate. We're going to talk about how you can accelerate your time to market with connectivity and control. Um, how you can innovate, how you can add features that your customers really care about. And how can I differentiate? I mean, lighting is all about energy efficiency, but how can I go beyond energy efficiency in my lighting solution? In terms of agenda, so we are going to start by looking at the state of the lighting market today. So we're going to discuss some market trends. Um, more specifically, we're also going to look at LED lighting. Why is LED lighting becoming so popular today? Um, then we are going to look maybe a one to two years into the future, and we are going to discuss about control and connectivity, what's coming up in terms of that for lighting. And then we are going to look even further. We are going to look three to five years into the future, and we are going to discuss what is this uh, thing about smart lighting. What are some of the value and features that people are talking about? And we are going to um, finally end with that and see possibly if the demo does cooperate with me, uh, maybe one demo on smart lighting. So we start with looking at the lighting market. So I mean, all of you have been familiar from one end to the other. Oh, sorry. So why LEDs? So before we go there, so it kind of uh, offers a nice point for us to have a discussion. So I have a few shirts that I need to give away. So I would like to open it up to you guys to give me some ideas. Why LED lighting? Low power. Low power, fantastic. They last forever, that's awesome, absolutely, long life. Everybody wants five, 10 years out of that, in fact, sometimes even more. Oh, more creative sorry. solutions? Sorry? More creative lighting solutions? Absolutely, that's a fantastic one. More creative lighting solutions. Okay. Better light, actually it's uh, brighter, it's guided, it's, it's like daylight. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a lot of, it's actually, a, you can do color tuning. Anything else? I'm out of shirts now, I can give you candy. <laughs> color, absolutely, yes. You can do different color with it, I think. Oh, go for it, <laughs> okay. Absolutely, all of this and more, right? So energy efficiency, that's the biggest reason it's going. Um, long life, small size is actually very small, so it actually allows you to fit into a lot of different form factors. Instant on, you can actually turn it on and off very quickly, so there are actually some interesting applications behind that. Um, produces color directly, somebody mentioned that. So it's able to do that without adding filters. Anybody who's done incandescent lighting, you have this really big filter you have to put in front of it to get any color. This actually, you can do it without using any filters. And the last one is more for fluorescent lighting. So if many of you have been fluorescent lighting, getting rid of that, especially in a commercial setting, a lot of different mercury, so getting rid of that is a big hassle, so there's no mercury. 
Um, needless to say, challenges exist. So thermal management, so LED lighting gets hot. Uh, managing semiconductor drivers to do this is a big challenge. Cost, um, it's still much more expensive than the other lighting solutions that's out there. And it's a bit of an unfamiliar technology. Um, lighting people have been dealing with incandescent lighting for 100 years now. Before that, they're used to dealing with candles. So this is unfamiliar technology, a technology that changes every two years or three years. So it's a lot of challenges. So there is healthy skepticism also about it. So first, what is the biggest driver? The biggest driver behind LED lighting has been regulations. And regulations came about because of energy efficiency requirements. So if you look at pretty much every country in the world, they said like, we don't want to use energy efficient, uh, I mean, low efficiency lighting anymore. We don't want to use incandescent. We don't want to use halogen. Um, this is both for residential as well as commercial. In fact, pretty much in most of the countries that you see in the list here, you cannot go beyond 40 watts. If you want to buy an incandescent light over 40 watts, you simply cannot do it. Um, they're pushing for more and more energy efficiency, and in most cases, the best way to address that market, to address the energy efficiency, is to go towards LED lighting. So somebody mentioned brightness. So LED today offers most lumens per watt and better price per watt. Now, those who are not familiar with the term lumens, lumens is a measure of the light output power from the lamp. So if you look at the red line today, it's already the most efficient energy lighting. And the blue bar kind of tells you that it's not just reached its peak yet, there's still more to go. And if it does get there, it will be much, much better in terms of energy efficiency compared to any other lighting solution out there. Now, as they say in the TV commercial, wait, there's more. Now, not only that, it's a price. The price has been actually falling pretty rapidly. So the performance is improving by 5 to 10% every year. But at the same time, the, I mean, the performance is improving 5 to 10%. But the price is falling like 25, 30% a year. I mean, I used to go to Home Depot and when I had to buy $20 two years ago. Now I can buy one for $6. So it's just the economics of adopting LED lighting is becoming easier and easier. So again, so not going? It's cutting out. Oh, it's cutting out. Okay. You want me to turn the other one off? Uh, yes, please. Oh. So the other part of it, let's. So let's looking at, look at some market data. If you look at the install base of LED lighting, we do see that we expect a pretty strong growth. Now, this growth is basically across multiple end markets, whether you're talking residential, whether you're talking industrial, whether you're talking commercial. So all of these different markets, we expect to see a very strong growth in LED lighting. Um, not only indoor application, a lot of outdoor applications as well. Um, in US, many, many municipalities have adopted LED lighting for street lighting. Uh, there are a lot of stadiums who are starting to look at LED lighting for street lighting. So it's becoming a technology that's beginning to have a really large footprint. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, uh, adopting any new technologies has challenges. So LED lighting is not the first one to run into it. So if you look at what happened to incandescent lighting 100 years ago, Everybody were trying to slide bulbs with matches, <laughs> right? I mean, like, yeah, I mean, they used to candles for thousands of years before that. So, so LED is facing pretty much the same technology challenges that people had a hundred years ago. So what are people doing with LED lighting? How are they implementing it? And what are some of the challenges to be aware of? The first part of it is LED lighting needs drivers. So this is something which is very different from incandescent lighting. Now, if you went and had your traditional bulb, you screw it into your socket, connect it to the AC mains, you're good to go. It takes all of less than a minute to set up. But LED drivers typically, LED lighting needs something called drivers. And the reasons are many. So the first one is simply that LED is a light emitting diode. Now we know from our physics 101, Diodes need direct current. Now your supplies are AC, so you need to figure out some way to convert your AC to DC. Okay, that's something relatively straightforward to do. The second one is actually a bit more challenging. Again, if you remember from our physics 101, diodes are extremely nonlinear devices. So if you try to drive a diode with a constant voltage source, it simply doesn't work very well. The brightness and current are going to change all over the place. 
In fact, many of them have a very, very strongly temperature dependent forward voltage. So your brightness is going to vary depending on whether it's day or night or there's not going to be any constant uh, light coming from the lamp. So the best way to do it, if you look at LEDs light, is actually related very closely to the current through the diode. So you need to have some way of driving that with a constant current source. Uh, last part of it, diodes are relatively low voltage devices. They typically have a forward voltage somewhere between three to four volts. So you need to have a way to step down the voltage from 110 volts or 220 volts, depending on where you are, to three volts. So, so you need some driver which can do that. Um, again, people who have been familiar with power supply designs, you typically need to use a switching regulator. Uh, you need to worry about your power factor, have a power factor close to one so that you can get the maximum efficiency out of LED light. So if you look at the state of the LED lighting today, um, a lot of it uses analog control. And the way they do this is they have a two-stage approach. The first stage is called the PFC control, or the AC to DC. And the second stage is called the LED control, or the DC to DC. Um, the PFC is the first part of it. It takes the AC voltage and converts it to a DC voltage. Um, it also, in many cases, in US, especially, there is UL requirement. So it provides isolation. It provides step down. Um, the other part of it is also it does what they call power factor correction. It helps to remove the harmonics in the load so that you get a very good efficiency out of it. And this produces a DC voltage. The next part of it is going to take this DC voltage and convert it to a constant current because LEDs want constant current. Um, so there's a way to do that. Um, and typically, again, if you look at different bulbs, depending on the light output that you want, whether you want 10 watts, 50 watts, or 100 watts, you'll end up having multiple strings. And you need to do individual control of each of these different strings. So looking a bit deeper into what each of these really looks like, um, so this is, again, a simplistic block diagram. Um, you can see that uh, it actually does a very good job of achieving energy efficiency, which was the initial goal of LED lighting is to do very good efficiency. Many manufacturers who are doing LED lighting today are able to get more than 90% efficiency. In fact, now that bar is even going towards 95. So they're getting really good numbers today in terms of energy efficiency. Um, this one is not a non-isolated stage, but at the same time, you can also convert it to an isolated stage. Um, very low cost. As I mentioned, you're able to go down to really low cost at retail today. But what's the challenge? now? The fact is, yes, you can go very low cost, but you're going to land up with a high component count if you start to include the number of discretes. And I shall show this in the next slide in terms of a reference implementation. Your component co cost is very high. You have a lot of cheap components, but you have many of those. You have very low flexibility in terms of current control. Uh, many of them use analog ASICs, and you have kind of a fixed strategy in what you can do. That's good for some application, not so good for other ones. And finally, if you're going to talk of control connectivity, you're going to talk about dimming, you need to talk about some standard open connectivity standards, you're beginning to add components, which is beginning to add cost. So here is an example of a reference design that we did for one of our customers. And you can see that though the whole cost of this is 50 to 60 cents, the number of components in that is more than 50, a lot of it being discrete. What's the challenge? First, you're going to be space constrained. Lamps are space constrained applications. And the second big part of it is long life. We want to guarantee 5, 10, 15 years. And pretty much all of us who have been put on engineering hats know that the more components they are, the more points of failure. So you really don't want this kind of an application. You want to have as much integration and as few components as possible, especially if you're pushing to push long life into the product. So. Is analog sufficient? And the answer is, it depends. It depends really on what you're looking to achieve. If you're looking for an energy efficient alternative to your regular incandescent bulbs, absolutely. It's a fantastic uh, replacement. But at the same time, it's not doing much more than that. Um, the focus has been on reducing cost, basically to match the cost of the bulb. And we are getting there. I mean, a bulb is a dollar at retail. The LED lamp today is $6. So it's still got a ways to go, but it's getting close. It was $20 two, three years ago. So it's getting there. Um, the other part of it, residential applications, when I need to do retrofit, fantastic. It's a great fit. I've got already a whole bunch of sockets in my house, and I don't want to rip all of them out. 
It's great to go put in an LED bulb. It works very well. Where is the challenge? So if you look at it, it's great for residential, but not so great for buildings. Buildings have been hotels, um, the office buildings that all of you work in, because what happens is when you come into commercial buildings, there are actually different standards. Um, there are building codes. Now, building codes require interface to sensors. Um, they require to have central command. Um, they want to have flexibility in terms of dimming. So when you start to add all of these different requirements, the, the solution is just not sufficient. You need something a bit more. So we start to look at why control and connectivity. A big part of this is building codes. Now, regulations were driving us from incandescent to LED lighting, but to add control and con connectivity into LED lighting, the big driving factor is building codes. Now, building codes have been evolving. Now, previously, it just used to have something related to heating and cooling, but now building codes are beginning to add stuff for lighting. They have requirements on the maximum lighting output power that you can do. Um, they're going to much more advanced features. They're requiring uh, requirements to add sensors. They want you to do daylight harvesting. They want you to add occupancy sensors. They want minimum quantifiable savings when you add controls. So as, to, as they start to add all of this, whether you're starting to look at ASHRAE, IECC, California has its own Title 24, all of these are starting to add a lot more codes geared towards lighting. So here you see a couple of different examples. Um, California Title 24, it actually has a maximum uh, power that you can actually put on lighting. It's 0.8 watts per square feet. You can't put more than that. Um, they have specific requirements to day daylight harvesting, which means I need to add photo sensors. And you need to be able to do that. Um, you have things for controls, you have things for commissioning. Um, ASHRAE also, you can start to look, they're actually pushing for minimum quantifiable saving. So if I'm going to deploy 90.1 to 2010 or something, they want to see at least a 20% improvement in energy efficiency in your building. So we talked about what is driving it. So what are we going to control? So if you're going to do this, what are we looking to control the LED light? Um, typically, it comes down to controlling the light output power. Basically, it's translates to flexibility in controlling the dimming. Now, again, the ideal wish list, if you talk to any marketing person, would be to go from 0.1% to 100%. That's the ideal wish list. But the reality is it's going to be a bit smaller. If you hit 1%, that's usually a good achievement. Uh, 5 to 10% would be acceptable. Uh, from a standards point of view, they may want you to go 5%, 10%. But again, the wish list is to do 0.1% to 100%. And the next one is a more interesting one that's kind of a bit of futuristic because it adds a lot more cost. Um, and we shall discuss this in through the future application, is ability to tune the color. Um, ideally, if my outside light is like a daylight and my indoor light looks very yellow, it kind of creates a bit of mismatch. So we want to be able to match the outside light and the in inside light so it looks pretty seamless. And that way, we can also add some amount of daylight harvesting, and it creates a harmonious workplace. Um, the other part of it is flexibility. So load conditions are going to change. You're going to have more load, less load um, as your dimming requirements change as you go through the day. So ability to have flexibility in dealing with multiple loads is big. And finally, if you're going to have any building um, support for remote diagnostics, you need to have your central admin, um, your building super being able to control all of your lights. So you need to have central control. How? Um, basically, adding sensors and controllers and adding connectivity. And of course, it can be one of several different ways. It can be wired or wireless. Um, again, we'll discuss all of this in more detail, but that's how you're going to do this. And the other way you're going to, other thing which you need to go to is digital control. So the analog control is great if you're just going to do a fixed control. But when you start to do flexibility, um, digital control is really good. So it allows you to have flexibility in terms of having multiple topologies, having multiple schemes, we can change in software. Um, you can create one platform that you can create and then through software create multiple parts out of it, multiple geographies, multiple end applications. Um, it gives you a low bomb count. Basically, it allows you to do high integration, which means that you don't have 50, 60 discrete sitting in your system. And the last part of it, I mean, people who have dealt with MCUs know this very well. For the lighting industry, it's something new. Um, we can do a lot of communication. So we can host communication protocol stacks. It's fairly straightforward to do wired and wireless connectivity when using MCUs. 
So let us look at more of this platform approach. How do we do this um, using MCUs? So here are some of the common topologies that you use in lighting. So for the AC to DC, the first stage, um, typically there is a flyback. So this allows you to do the isolation as well as step down. Um, the other one is the push-pull converter. It looks similar to the flyback. Um, the advantage being that it works on both sides of the cycle. So if you are doing high power application, you go with the push-pull. For moderate application, flyback is sufficient. Um, on the DC to DC side, again, um, people who are dealt with power supply design, uh, very standard. You want to step down, it is a buck converter. You want to step up, it is a boost. And then you do a buck boost when you want the flexibility. Now the interesting part of it is pretty much all of these topologies can be handled with a single MCU. So you can take the MCU, you um, can all do all of this, and if they usually in the exact same chip, it allows you to have the flexibility to do all of this. So you can literally create a platform, and then you can change it on the fly using software. The next part of it is control. So when we talked about control, a big part of what we talked about was dimming. And to do dimming, uh, there's a very standard way that the LED uh, industry has done this. And this is basically to use a switch in series with the diode. And we have a timer that controls the switch. And as the switch turns on and off, you control the current going into the diode. Um, as you change the duty cycle of the timer, you're going to change the amount of average current into the diode. And then you're going to change the diode brightness. Let's pick an example. So I think. Very simple, say I have a timer, it has a period of 100. If I'm on for 10 cycles out of 100, I have a duty cycle of 10%, which means that my LED light is on, is 10% brightness. You can barely see it on the slide there. If I have it for 20%, so I have an, uh, a 20% average duty cycle, 20% current. If I do 50%, it's 50% average duty cycle. And as I begin to have more and more on, the LED gets brighter and brighter. Now, the interesting part of it is this looks great, but this has a subtle trade-off. And the subtle trade-off is there's a trade-off between your minimum dimming level and your timer period. So again, let's pick an example. So suppose I want to do a 10% dimming. Your marketing guy comes to you and says, I want to do a 10% dimming. 10% is 1 over 10. So if I have a uh, on time of 1, I need a period of 10 cycles. Straightforward. Very easy. Now, what happens if you need to do a one percent dimming? If you have to do that, if it comes up with, oh, I got a great opportunity, I need to do one percent. Now you need to be on for one cycle out of hundred. So now period now has become hundred cycles. It's it's ten x longer, and what that means is not only the period longer, but all the filters we have to put in terms of capacitors, inductors have become ten x larger. So it becomes a challenge from a space constraint. It also becomes a challenge from a cost constraint. All of these components are getting bigger and more expensive. And if you want to do 0.1%, it's like 1,000 cycles. So that's even more. So that's why you can see that hitting a minimum dimming of 0.1% is not just the timer, but just it becomes longer and longer, and it has cost implications. Oh, sorry. OK, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I'm not using the mic well. So. So how do we get around this trade-off? So the first approach that we have is something called dithering. Um, what dithering allows you to do is add an extra cycle um, into your timer output periodically. Now, if I have to do it in software, um, we take an example um, pretty much the, you see on the table on the right. Say if you look at saying we have 20 on cycles on a period of 100, so that's a 20% dimming. Now, if I have to do it in software, I can change it to 21, which means I got a 1% resolution step. Now, the uh, way to do it is, if you're going to do it in hardware, I can have a peripheral that says, let me do 21 cycles every 16 cycles. Now, there's no way you can do this in software, but I can have a hardware peripheral that I say, every 16 cycles, once every 16 cycles, give me a pulse which is 21, and the 15 other cycle gives me a pulse which is 20. Now, if you do the math, if you figure out what is my average pulse width now, it's actually 21 by 16. I mean, it's, so because you have it on for only 1 16th. Now, effectively, you increase your resolution by a factor of 16. So now you can do 0 0.0625 percentage dimming without changing your timer period. Your timer period is still remain the exact same 100 cycles, 
But what that hardware has allowed you to do is do a much higher resolution. So this has an additional advantage. Now what it does is, um, so when you look at the control loop, it actually allows you to do something a bit more subtle. So when I look at, so here you see the diagram here, the one in the pink is the current through the sense resistor. The sense resistor is the one in series with the LED, so it's used to measure what is the LED current. Now if you look at the pink one, you're beginning to see fluctuation. Now again, maybe you've got an open quiz at this time. Why do, you, why do we not like the fluctuation there? Bad lighting, uh, there's, another, there's a key word there, which if you're used to LED lighting. Flicker, absolutely, there you go. It's flicker. Okay, oh, not a great throw, sorry. <laughs> so that's flicker. So if you look at it, people say, oh, the light flickers under low light. If you go to like 1% dimming, I see flicker. And that's basically your loop hunting. It's basically your limit cycle. Right? So, so if you look at it, if you turn on dithering, it's actually become a lot, lot more stable, actually. So your flickering artifacts actually go down a lot. So this is the other hidden advantage of doing dithering. The next um, approach is basically to do what we call burst dimming. Um, and this is basically also called on-off dimming. We use two timers. We have one timer getting the output of the other. So one timer creates a burst of signals, and the other one is used to gate it. So you can create, OK, a burst of signals, and you just turn it off so that it actually the light output decreases. Again, uh, this has some advantages. Um, one of them has to do with physics of LEDs. So when you're doing LEDs, um, sometimes, or not all of them, actually change color as the dimming level changes. So that the shade of red or the shade of blue or the shade of green, changes are better. It's not huge, but it does change. So when you're running at like high current, it's got something. When you're running at low current, it's got a slightly different color. Now, if you're trying to do something which has a very high CRI, color rendering index, that's a challenge. So what this on-off allows you to do is basically is keeping the same current level, but you turn it off when you're not using it. So it appears less bright. And the other part of it is when you want to go to really, really low dimming levels, you start to kind of mix your dithering as well as your on-off dimming. And by using a combination of these two, you're able to go to really, really low levels. So in addition to timers, what else do we need? Uh, typically, we need a whole bunch of analog peripherals um, to assist the timer. Um, the first and most important one, of course, the ADC. Um, the ADC is what looks at the current running through the LED resistor, uh, through the, sorry, through the sense resistor and converts it to a voltage. Um, typical rule of thumb is it needs to be at least as good as the dimming level you're trying to achieve. For example, if you're trying to do 0.1% dimming, that translates to a 60 dB dynamic range. A 60 dB dynamic range translates to around a 10-bit ADC converter. So, so if you if you're Marketing, I asked you to do a 0.1% dimming. So you're looking at at least a 10-bit ADC, if not more. The second part of it is the programmable gain amplifier. So when you start to run into really low currents, you actually have a signal. You also have a lot of noise. So you want to be able to gain up the signal so that um, you make the job of your ADC converter a bit better. Um, typically, uh, if you are able to do a gain anywhere from 4 to 16x, that translates to anywhere between two to four bits. So your ADC effectively looks as instead of being a 10-bit, looks like either a 12-bit or a 14-bit ADC. The next part of it, of course, comparators. So user safety is a big thing um, uh, when you're doing LEDs. Um, the other part of it, we are usually trying to guarantee pretty long life. So overcurrent is a very big deal. So if you're running, a, running your LEDs hot, Instead of running for 10 years, it's going to fall back to five years. So you're going to get a lot of complaints and product returns. So having a comparator that actually turns off the current when it gets pretty hot becomes very important. And a part of it also is you have a DAC. So if you want to set a threshold for your comparator, you want to say, OK, uh, once I hit this, start to turn this off. This allows you flexibility in terms of how I can actually set preferences to comparator thresholds. So that's with dimming. That's the control part of it. The next part of it is connectivity. Now, if you look at different buildings, um, there are multiple types of buildings. So 
the first part of it is very simple. Um, you're talking of just a simple room. You just want an on-off control. Maybe you have a sensor or two, uh, but there's no connectivity to outside. It's very simple. The next part of it, local systems. Maybe you've got a zone in a building, a group of different buildings. Um, you do some proprietary connectivity. Um, you have some pre-programmed logic, turn on at 9 o'clock, turn off at 5 o'clock. Um, simple, but one more level of complexity over a non-connected bulb. The third one, a fully integrated system, and this is the one we shall dig a bit deeper into. Um, these are where you start to integrate into your building automation system. Um, you typically are looking at open standards, um, both on the wired side as well as wireless side, so that um, you can bring in components from a lot of different vendors to create the whole system. Um, it allows you to create open protocols. It allows for remote monitoring. It also allows for cloud connectivity, so if you've got your certain buildings that you want control centrally, um, you've got some of them which allow you to do that. So on the wired side, um, you've got a whole host of communication protocols. Um, two of the most common ones are 0 to 10 volts, which is very common in US, and what you call PWM dimming, which is very common in Japan. Uh, very simple protocols. Everything that's wired together behaves together similarly. So it's very simple, so all of them share the same bus. Um, the flip side of it is uh, they are very simple in the sense that you cannot have individual addresses. So they're all going to behave together. So if you want to control some set of lamps differently, you'll have to build a different network for those. And the other part of it, it's one way. So the master is going to talk to all the slaves. It's just going to put a command, and there's no way to get data back. The next one is DALI. Now, this is the one which is um, extremely popular. Um, the first part of it is DALI allows individual addresses. So you can address each lamp individually. Um, the standard is flexible enough that you can address sensors as well as lamps. So it allows you to give that flexibility. It's a two-way communication. So I can have sensors which are actually creating data, telling the controller, OK, I see 10 people there. You need to turn on the light. Um, you have ability for the master then to talk to the LED lamps. OK, turn that on. The other interesting thing about DALI is that it actually puts out power on the lines. Um, this is something not everyone is aware of, that it actually allows you to put power also. Um, the power is, I think, limited somewhere between 12 and 20 watts. I don't remember the exact number today. But um, what that allows you to do is I cannot power my LED light out of the DALI, of course. I still need an AC source. But if I have sensors, if I have got occupancy sensors, I've got daylight sensors, I don't need to pull another set of wires. I can easily power them out of the DALI bus. Um, the challenge with DALI, uh, it's got a higher install cost. You'll have some time have to ship a DALI bus along with it. It's not as low cost as your 0 to 10 volts. The last one, um, this is not as common, but still we've seen some people do it, is to use Ethernet. Um, Cat5 cable pretty much is available standard across pretty much every office building, um, every commercial building. You see this IT infrastructure is out there. Um, there is power over Ethernet, so which allows up to 24 watts on the single wire. So that makes it also flexible in terms of, okay, I don't need to have the labor cost of pulling another set of wire. Um, so that is another option, but of course the cost of an Ethernet connected bulb is much higher. So uh, very limited installation, but we do see people use this. So let's dive a bit deeper into DALI. Now, Typically, if you're doing DALI, you need some sort of hardware support. Um, I say this, but if you look at the history of how people have done this today, they've actually done it in software. They actually do it in software, um, and they toggle a GPIO pin. Now, that works. It works for actually many applications, but it's got a few challenges. The first part of it is CPU intensive. So every 4.8, so the data rate is anywhere from 4,800 baud or 9,600 baud. So each time the pin toggles, you're going to get an interrupt. So your CPU is going to get an interrupt every 5 to 10 milliseconds, which means it's not going to do something much more than just the DALI. Um, so if you want the CPU at the same time to do your dimming, it's not going to be very good at doing both. So, so if you're doing DALI, usually people have an MCU for DALI and MCU for dimming control, which kind of goes against your high integration concept. Um, the other part of it, software. So when you're trying to do um, delays in software, yes, MCUs have a certain bound. They can do that OK, but there's going to be variation. Now, all of these specs have a limitation in terms of what the bit width needs to be, especially if you have multiple slaves hanging on the same wire. So 
Um, sometimes people have a challenge in setting this exact width width. The people who try to use timers to do a more precise width. Um, but there's some challenge in doing it completely in software. And finally, there's a new version of DALI coming out, oh, DALI edition 2.0. And that requires much more hardware support. And the software approach doesn't scale very well to that. Um, the solution around it is to use a hardware DALI peripherals. Um, actually, the next slide, I'll give you a bit more detail on how we typically do it. Um, the big part of it is the peripheral handles pretty much all of the data communication. Uh, which means the CPU is freed up to do your dimming control. So you have the integration of using only one MCU. And the good part of it is you're beginning to get more future proof. You add enough features in the DALI peripheral on the hardware side so that you can actually forward port it to edition 2.0. So this slide kind of shows how we do the implementation of the Renesis MCU. Um, so this kind of shows. Um, the data flow in and out. So typically, you're coming in on a wire. You have a diode bridge, basically, to filter the power out. Um, and then you come in into the MCU itself. Um, on the MCU side, uh, DALI has something called Manchester encoding. So we have a hardware peripheral to do Manchester encoding on the transmit and Manchester decoding on the receive. Um, but we also do packetization, which means we add start bit, stop bit, framing bit. So we add all of that. So your CPU is not actually working to do all of this. All of this is being done automatically by the peripheral. All that the CPU says is this is the payload, send it out, or this is the payload, take it in into the system. So you can see again um, from the table here, DALI has a whole list of specs. So I think this is just a very short list. And pretty much most of these are supported by the hardware DALI peripheral. So you start to do this in software, it starts to become pretty tedious quick. Um, in addition to that, now going into wireless. Um, the most common one you see on the wireless side is Zigbee. So if you've been following the lighting market, Zigbee is the most common one. Uh, whether you're looking at residential, whether you're looking at commercial, both of those Zigbee is pretty popular. Um, the big attraction to Zigbee, of course, it's a mesh network, which means it can scale to hundreds, thousands of nodes without trying to get really complex. So the scaling becomes something which is easily handled. And the other part of it is Zigbee has a property called self-healing. So if one bulb fails in the middle, it's not like a whole network goes down. There's ways around it so that it can heal itself in the network side. Challenges with Zigbee, the biggest one is need for a gateway. So if you've got Zigbee, it doesn't translate very well to our TCP IP world, uh, which is our normal world, the smartphones, PCs, and all of those. So you need a gateway, and that's a big stumbling block for many implementations. Um, some challenges with interoperability, so Zigbee's profiles sometimes work well, sometimes they don't play nice with everybody else. So there are some interoperability concerns, though it's become less uh, compared to what it was. And the third part of it is um, there's more and more interest in 802.15.4, so uh, the limited use of Zigbee outside of lighting is beginning to get mitigated out of that. And the next one that we see is Bluetooth Smart. So Everybody is beginning to have Bluetooth smart on the smartphone, so they want to see, can I talk directly from a smartphone into the bulb? That's what everybody wants to do. So that's the big attraction. I don't need to have an extra box. I can directly talk to my smartphone device, my laptop, um, and it's a very low power operation, so that's very important when the lights are turned off. So Bluetooth smart becomes uh, a pretty interesting solution. Um, challenge is couple. First is mesh. So it doesn't support mesh. There's a roadmap to do mesh, but that's a bit further out. Um, so that's the first challenge, which means I have to talk to individually one lamp at a time, which is kind of not scalable. But if I'm sitting in a home, that's a fantastic thing. I can turn off the light from my bed. But if I want to do it for a building, it becomes a challenge. Um, the other part of it is range. Um, Bluetooth Smart itself has been created for fairly short range. It started in the wearable industry, in the activity monitor industry. So um, the range has been limited, so when you're trying to get into a building and you're trying to go to a longer range, there's been some challenges with using Bluetooth Smart. Last one is Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi, again, uh, pretty much the biggest advantage of that, it's the most commonly installed wireless. So if you go any office, any commercial building, you've got Wi-Fi. I mean, if you go into any Starbucks, you've got Wi-Fi. So that makes it easy. It makes it easy to set up a network. Um, it's a direct connection. I don't need a gateway box. Challenge, of course, is cost. If you're going to put Wi-Fi in a bulb, it's going to get pretty expensive quick. 
Um, finally, sub gigahertz, um, there are many of those. Each vendor has their own sub gigahertz. Uh, the good, good thing about sub gigahertz is you, it allows you to achieve low cost. Um, it allows you to achieve long power, I mean, uh, low power and long reach. Um, challenge, of course, is vendor lock-in. You're, you're locked into a specific vendor. You have no interoperability. So you've got to go pretty much get the entire bomb out of your same vendor, whether it's your sensor, controller, your network, everything. Now that is usually people are trying to get away from that. Uh, so if you have attended the Renesis um, Bluetooth um, um, course, you would have seen this. We offer a great solution for Renesis for the Bluetooth low energy solution, the Bluetooth Smart. Uh, very low bomb cost, highly integrated solution. Uh, you take the device, add a few components, you've got a ready to go solution. Uh, low power, so which is very useful when you're actually operating off because your lights are not only going to remain off, many cases, a lot of them are going to be off. So you don't want them to be vampires actually sucking out power when they're off, right? So you want them to be actually as low power as possible when they're off. And finally, we have something called an adaptable RF technology. You've got trade-off between sensitivity uh, and power consumption. So when you're doing long reach, you want higher power. When doing low reach, you want more, less power so that you can conserve battery life. In addition to that, we have solutions, Wi-Fi solutions with our partners. So we have two partners. Um, the first one is called Red Pine Signal. So we have um, 802.11 ABGN solutions with them. Um, it offers high throughput, um, good reach. Uh, we have multiple solution kits available with them for most of our MCUs. Um, the other partner is Gainspan. Um, again, uh, we have 802.11 BGN solutions with them. Uh, low power operations, and then we have multiple solutions again for all our MCUs. Um, we also have some very cool smartphone apps to control lights um, using a smartphone app to control the board. So if you look at all of this, I mean, we talked about control and connectivity. We talked about a lot of it over the last few days, uh, last few slides. Um, so Renesis, um, the, we have a lighting MCU, which we call the RL78I1A. Uh, pretty much supports everything that I talked about. So it's about, you've got hardware and software to support multiple topologies. You have dimming control. We have all the different analog peripherals. We have the connectivity solutions with hardware DALI, as well as solutions with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So if you look at this, uh, this one concern which is actually creeping up in LED lighting. So as long as LED lighting was just wired, it was not a big concern. But once you start to go into wireless, there's a concern that it becomes open for hacking. It becomes a security hole in the system. So again, as you've heard uh, during our panel yesterday, you have, people are going to go after the weakest link. So people are, we have had instances where people hacked into the bulb, they got only not only into the lighting network, but they actually went into the home network and were able to steal Wi-Fi passwords. So it's like, yes, you are the starting point, and depending on how authenticated you are with your lighting network, you are basically exposing yourself. So we had, Quite a few of these, there was one company called LifeX out of San Francisco which had that, and then there was a Philips Hue bulb which went through that. So a uh, few of these which challenges. Um, again, if you've heard about Renesis Synergy, so there are a couple of courses which went into fair amount of detail in terms of hardware and software security. So we offer a complete solution. So when you start to look at wireless solutions, um, having these software libraries are important for secure communications and over the air upgrades. So again, uh, this is more of an eye chart at this time. Um, so we have actually looked at several different IoT threats, and we are creating a pretty much a scalable product family. So depending on the needs of your application, we can customize the level of security that you need. So with that, uh, jump into the next part, um, which we call smart lighting. So smart lighting is what we call features that are coming out in the next not one to two, maybe a bit three to five years down, further down. Um, again, we have talked about this a bit already. Um, the key challenge with LED lighting today, it's, it's becoming a commodity. I can go to Home Depot and buy a bulb for five bucks, six bucks. So if I'm a lighting manufacturer, I need something else to do. I need to add some other value into my lighting, basically, to differentiate. Um, this is where smart lighting comes in. So we're going to discuss a couple of interesting features. First one, which you call color control. Um, how do I do mood-based lighting? How do I do something which is called circadian spectrum control? 
Um, the second one, uh, the interesting one is also called visible light communication. How do I use light to do data communication and indoor positioning? Um, I have a demo here that I will show uh, if time allows. Um, hopefully, we have some time to do that. So, the if you look at LED lighting, it has a huge advantage that it can produce color directly without need for filters. If you take a look at any other lighting, you need to add filters, which makes for a very clunky solution. So this can actually produce color directly. And this has created a lot of lighting related applications. So one of the things people are looking at is to change the lighting depending on the type of task people are doing. If I'm doing document entry or I'm doing something color related, I want something which is a bright white light. If I'm doing something which is more of a discussion oriented, maybe we do some a different color, maybe a warm light. Uh, mood based lighting for residences. There are quite a few startups who are starting to look at how can I do different mood based lighting? How can I actually sync up the lighting to my music system so that it can actually change as, as I do different music? Um, the third one is actually building color. So this is the Empire State Building. Um, they actually have put LED lighting on top of the building and they can change it based, as, based on the event of the day. So you can actually send a request to them if you've got a big event. They allow you to put different colors on top of the building. It's actually pretty nice. Um, the other place where people are starting to use this is in surgery. So when you're starting to have a surgery um, or you're starting to do medical, uh, you need something which is uh, what you call a high CRI. So which means that you actually have color reproduced accurately. Now this is very important when you're doing surgery. When you've got your doctor operating and the liver looks green, is that really a green or is that actually the LED lighting, right? So you need to know that. So having a C high CRI light actually enables you to look at that and say, yes, the color of that looks off. Um, the other thing is actually many of these surgeries usually are pretty long. Um, and, uh, some of them run into 10 hours, 15 hours, especially if you're going to open up the body cavity. So having LED lighting actually lowers the temperature of the operating table by up to 10 degrees which means that over a 10 hour period, it's, there's less drying out of the flesh. So a lot of hospitals are starting to look at this very seriously for the operating tables. Uh, the other one is it also, uh, this is a lot of new research going on. Um, so people are starting to have lighting which actually mimics a circadian um, rhythm. Now circadian rhythm um, is basically changes in people's behavior responding to lightness and darkness. Um, colloquially, it's called the body clock. So basically, that's the thing that goes off when you go grab a jet and go from east coast to west coast or vice versa. You're off all by three, four hours. That's your body clock. Now, the interesting thing about your body clock is actually it's not 24 hours. It's actually longer than 24 hours. But basically, exposure to sunlight sinks it up to a 24-hour cycle. Now, the interesting thing is actually having a healthy light is one that mimics this. So the color changes not only in brightness, sorry, the light changes not only in brightness, but also in color. So if you can see that the color changes as the day goes on. So having a light that actually mimics this actually is very productive. So there have been studies showing that it's less accidents, more productivity, people are feeling healthier, they feel better. And also just from a common sense point of view, if I'm sitting inside a building and the light inside looks just like the light outside, it, it feels more natural and feels better. Um, not only for um, uh, humans, but also for other light forms. Um, there have been some pretty enterprising plant growers who are looking to grow a lot of interesting plants in confined spaces. I won't say what they do, <laughs> so you can guess, but they have actually adopted this, they tailored this actually for different plants. They have actually, actually tailored the plant spectra. They figured out some colors work better than others. And when you want to grow them in confined spaces, it actually turns out to be a pretty healthy way to do it. Um, it's also a very interesting idea. People look at, I'm running out of space. We want to cure world hunger. I have to go and stuff horizontally. I have to start growing vertically. Um, this becomes a very interesting way to do it. And there are people also looking at for farm animals for improving milk and egg production. Uh, what this turns out to is something called dynamic CCT, color correlated temperature. Um, again, uh, if you're used to your physics, um, there's something called a black body curve. Um, that's the color of natural light. So as it changes in brightness, it changes also in color. That's what sunlight does. So the ideal thing is to follow what's marked in black on that uh, curve there. So as, as you change your brightness, you also change your color. So that's what your body thinks is natural. 
So in terms of implementation, what we need to do to implement that is to blend multiple LED strings, synchronize all of those, have multiple timer channels, typically um, four timer channels, four ADC, so we support all of that on the I1A. And the next one which I'll discuss is something called visible light communication. So this is uh, a pretty interesting application where people are actually using visible light to do data communication. And the way we do this is actually turn the light source on and off at a pretty high rate. If you do it at a high enough rate, a human being can't make out, but there are machines detectors which can detect it pretty easily. So this becomes a very neat way to use your LED retrofit to actually change it into a data communication source. Um, the fact that LEDs have a very small turn on time makes this a very great fit for this kind of application. A uh, few different applications, low speed communication market where they want to send information about the warning signs, they want to do indoor positioning. So those kind of applications, you may be in a commercial store and you may want to say, hey, I'm next to the shoe stand, give me a coupon for it. The building wants to do that, that may be one thing to do. Um, the other one is the vehicle to garage communication. I got my headlights, I put that on the LED on the front of my, on my headlights. It, the garage can say, oh, okay, that's the car that I recognize and it can automatically open. Um, there's also some research going on in the high-speed communication market where people are looking for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, headlights and tail lights communicating to each other to do vehicle-to-vehicle. -vehicle. Um, also looking at possibly an alternative to Wi-Fi. Um, Again, these are forward-looking technologies, so people are still trying to figure out how to do some of these. But the low-speed ones actually are beginning to already come in. Um, one of the interesting things which is happening with VLC is um, indoor positioning. Uh, pretty much anywhere I go without Google Maps these days, I don't know where I'm going. So it's become an integral part of what I do. But there's a big challenge with GPS. Can anyone tell me what it is? It doesn't work indoors, exactly, it doesn't work indoors. So, and the other part of it, it doesn't do elevation. So if I'm looking, if, even within a building, if I know I'm there, I don't know if I'm on the first floor, second floor, fifth floor, or the hundredth floor. Um, this is where uh, people are looking at multiple technologies, talking about indoor GPS, Wi-Fi, beacons. Um, VLC is actually a very interesting technology. It actually offers a very good accuracy in terms of um, where you can position yourself. How we do this is simple. Uh, pretty much what we do is um, we put a different ID number on each light, and each of these lights is transmitting their uh, ID number. Uh, you have a smartphone, you typically put a dongle on it. Um, you can receive, you can put it out and say, I'm under this light. You get an ID number. You typically have an app on the smartphone that goes to a database and says, this ID number means I am in Macy's in the shoe section, right? I mean, like, that's something that somebody can then go in a database, pull it up. So it's actually very useful because you can actually know which exact lamp you're under pretty quickly. So it's actually a very good indoor positioning system. And this is actually, thank you, it's actually beginning to, big. so we have seen some limited rollout of this already happening uh, where people are starting to use this in retails for coupons. So if I'm in a section here, um, this is the shoe section, I can look at it and say I'm here, um, can you tell me what's the latest deal of the day? And it will actually give you coupons for that section. So we have a solution today um, based on um, our, again, on a lighting MCU, uh, where we're able to modulate the light coming out of the, uh, basically we're able to modulate it at uh, what we call a CP1223 standard, which is around five kilobits per second, it's 4.8 kilobits per second. So the transmitter transmits the light out of it, and then we have a receiver board based on the same MCU. Uh, we're able to take that, demodulate it, figure out the signal, and decode the communication. Um, it works very well even in the presence of ambient light. So even in the presence of sunlight, it works very well. Um, it's a pretty low power, so we're able to do um, around 1.5 years at three hours a day on battery. So it actually does very well. And it also works very well um, with, at wide angles. So I have a demo here. Let me see if I'm able to show it. So I have the light being transmitted out of this transmitter. 
and you can see that it's able to receive something based on the light of that goes away. So here, um, at the end of this, you can come back here and I can actually show you this in more detail, but you can see that you can actually transmit from one to the other using the blue light. So, uh, so coming to the end of this, um, in conclusion, um, we discussed about control and connectivity. We had talked about why. We talked about how we are going to add, about, add connectivity and control. And we had discussed a couple of smart lighting solutions. Hopefully, at the end of this course, you had the tools, um, figured out how you can accelerate your time to market with connected lighting, um, possibly had some couple of ideas of what kind of LED features you can add into your application and how you can differentiate beyond just energy efficiency for your lighting. Thank you. Uh, open it up for questions. Yes. Yes, so with the DALI, uh, we have something called the EZ0012. So if you, uh, you can send me an email, I'll give you my card. Um, I can follow up with that. That's something that you can buy off the web. The VLC solution today, we are looking at creating the kits. We have a couple of advanced kits. Uh, that show that off, but uh, that's something that we can provide. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, you can. Now you can change the, the so, so the question is for a timer, can I change the frequency or can I change the time period? Now, what you need to effectively control is the average output. Now, if you change the frequency and keep the same duty cycle, then your average current is not going to change. But if you keep the same on time and change the period, of course, you're changing your duty cycle. So you can do it either way. So you, the one is called a PWM and one is called a PFM. But the approach is same. You're looking to change the average current in a predetermined way to change your LED brightness. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, which for the VLC? Dimming control. So the question is, is there a minimum frequency for the dimming control? Yes, there is definitely a minimum frequency. Um, typical control loops run in the, sorry, in the tens of kilohertz, if not hundreds of kilohertz. So the request, usually the problem is if you start to lower the frequency, the capacitors and inductors that you need to put begin to become a lot bigger. So by the time you come to where a human can perceive even in tens of kilohertz, it's already looking like a few microfarad and that's going to become bigger than anything else. So just from a cost point of view, people are actually pushing for even higher frequency. So I can go to a 0.1 micro and a 0.1 pico and I can make it smaller and more cost effective. So I think the, so the comment, just to repeat, is um, human perception is if you start to have artifacts below 80 hertz, it begins to get disturbing. You begin to get strobe light or flicker kind of effects. And above 130 hertz, it's, it's not as much. And I think he, he brings up a very good point. Um, usually, there is a bigger outer loop, which is doing dimming control, where you're just trying to set the dimming and trying to measure it. But the current control loop, where are setting the current of the LED, you actually run in tens of hertz if not hundreds of kilo sorry tens of kilohertz if not hundreds of kilohertz okay uh, any other questions so i guess yes please vlc will cause flicker yes vlc will do some of that um, again the reason we do that is that's why we go at a high enough frequency uh, but the combination of vlc and very low dimming will give you some artifacts so if you can actually try to do 1% dimming and then try to modulate it by half a person, that's 50% modulation. But if I'm on at 80% um, and I'm trying to do a 1% or 2% modulation, 
that's not as perceptible. So there is some trade-off with going to very low light level and still trying to do VLC. But if you're at a moderate brightness, it doesn't affect that as much. Thank you for bringing it up, Chris. Yes, anything else? Any more questions? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming over.